Shane Davidson is an artist who got hooked on genealogy and crime history while tracing the rogues in her grandfather's family tree. Shane lives in Ann Arbor, Michigan and blogs at capturedandexposed.com. She's the author of Queen of the Burglars, The Scandalous Life of Sophie Lyons. Originally from Northwest Ohio, which she visits on a regular basis, Denise Tessa currently lives and works in Western New York State. She's the author of Defending the Dillinger Gang, Jesse Levy and Bess Robbins in the Courtroom. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Christine. And um, hi, everybody. And thanks for joining us today. Today, we are going to tell you the stories of three women whose lives broke from the norms of their day. Sophie Lyons was a career criminal in the 19th and 20th centuries at a time when most professional criminals were men. Jesse Levy and Bess Robbins were among the first women to practice criminal law in the early 20th century. Together, they represented six members of the John Dillinger gang, a number far greater than their male counterparts. Now these women were on opposite sides of the law but they had more in common than one might think. Sophie and Jesse were Jewish immigrants whose families came to America fleeing persecution in Europe. And Bess was a first generation American also born to a Jewish family. All three women were bright, ambitious and eager to take on roles outside the expected norm. Today in the United States, we have three female Supreme Court justices. But in the mid 19th century, a woman couldn't even vote, much less get the education she needed to become an attorney. In fact, women were excluded from most jobs. And when a woman got married, her property, if she had any, became her husband's. So men were the primary wage earners and women were responsible for housework and childcare. Working class women in particular struggled to support themselves and their families with low paying jobs in factories or as servants in private homes. Middle and upper class women generally didn't work outside the home and were completely dependent on their husbands or families for income. Now, Sophie Lyons thought of crime the way other women viewed nursing or teaching. It was her career and she was very good at it. Not only did she end up a rich woman, she also had a very interesting life. Her crimes ranged from pickpocketing and shoplifting to sexual blackmail and bank robbery. And she started early. She started as a child when her parents forced her to steal and she continued to work as a criminal for more than 50 years. Now, when I heard about Sophie, the first time I heard of her, I really wanted to read her biography and I, I assumed that there would would be one, but I was amazed that there had never been uh, any book written about her. So I decided that I had to write it. Now, New York City in the 19th century, uh, Sophie Van Elken was actually born in Germany in 1847, and she and her family were among the thousands of newcomers who arrived in New York City in the early 1850s with really nothing, nothing but the clothing on their backs. So New York City was on the verge of the Gilded Age at this time, and it was a divided city. There were a handful of wealthy families who lived in huge mansions, while large numbers of impoverished families like Sophie's lived cheek to jowl in lower Manhattan. It's hard to know if Sam Sophie's family intended to take up crime for a living when they arrived. But within a few years, they were showing up on the police books. Sophie's father, Jacob, ran a business, a little dry goods shop, where he fenced stolen items. Now, this was the era of Tammany Hall and Boss Tweed. And in order to stay in the good graces of the police, people had to pay bribes. And in the early 1860s, Jacob went to prison when he refused to pay a bribe to the police. Sophie's mother, Mary, was a pickpocket and a shoplifter. Sophie showed a talent for pickpocketing as a child. Mary would dress her up in nice clothes to fit in and they would go to places in the city where the wealthy were congregating, places like museums and 
the ferry docks and the shopping districts. And Sophie's mother taught her to carefully slit open pockets with a knife and get cash and valuables inside. If she didn't work hard enough, she'd be punished later at home with beatings and burns from hot pokers. Now we know that child abuse leaves lasting scars, but then no one realized what was that that was going to be a, a very traumatic event in her life. And in those days, children were just seen as little adults. So when Sophie was arrested, she claimed that she enjoyed it. She claimed that police officers gave her candy and she was happy to be away from the strife at home. But she was becoming the primary source of income for her family. So they bribed the police to keep her times in jail short. But when she was 12, Sophie committed a crime that got her sent to the House of Refuge on Randall's Island in New York City. The House of Refuge was the first juvenile detention facility in America, and it was accessible only by boat, as you can see in the photo on the left. So the institution was built to house boys, and Sophie was among the first group of girls sent to the House of Refuge. The boys learned trades there, but the girls were only taught the skills needed to work as servants on the lowest rungs of society. And Sophie decided that she was never going to work as a servant. So when she got out of the house of refuge, she was taken under the wing of a woman named Marm Mandelbaum. Now Marm was, uh, a German Jewish immigrant to New York City, and she was the most successful fence in 19th century America. She had an empire built on stolen goods, and many of them were fenced out of her shop on the Lower East Side. She never shoplifted or pickpocketed herself, but she didn't need to because she had so many talented criminals working for her. Marm took good care of her pickpockets and shoplifters. She paid several thousand dollars a year, a huge amount at the time, to keep criminal attorneys on retainer to be able to get her crew released on bail whenever they were arrested. And in fact, Sophie, who hated her own mother by this point, referred to Mandelbaum as mother. So Marm threw elaborate dinner parties at her home where some of the New York's most notorious crooks were wined and dined like the elite of New York society. Most of them were poor immigrants or children of immigrants who were the chance to party like the high society people. And while she was working for Marm, Sophie met a man named Ned Lyons. Now he was an immigrant from Ireland who had grown up in Massachusetts and he was making a name for himself in New York City at this time as a bank robber. Now, Ned wasn't exactly handsome, but he was a flashy dresser with a muscular build and he loved to fight. He never backed down from a fight. So just before Christmas in 1865, Ned and Sophie got married. Now, Sophie was already pregnant. She didn't bother to get a divorce from her first husband who was a petty criminal named Maury Harris. <clears throat> bank burglary in the 19th century. Uh, there's no doubt that Ned's fame as a bank robber made him an attractive catch as a husband because bank burglars were at the top of the criminal hierarchy at this time. Now, this is not like in Dillinger's time, you know, in the 20th, in the 1930s, in the 20th century. Bank robberies usually did not involve gun guns at this point. Uh, most of the large banks were in New York City and robberies of these large banks required planning and skill and patience. And most bank robbers had some kind of specialized knowledge of ways to open vaults and safes and they would carry the many tools they would need for this kind of work. So the trick was to get access to the bank when no one was around. So Ned, along with several partners, leased the basement below the Ocean Bank at Greenwich and Fulton Streets in Lower Manhattan in 1869. And working at night over the course of several weeks, they drilled through the ceiling. This was the ceiling of the space they were in, which was the floor of the bank. 
And on a Sunday when the bank wasn't guarded, they removed the last of the flooring, broke into the vault and they made off with a fortune. The amount of, that they made off with was estimated to be between half a million and a million dollars of the currency of that time. Now the ocean bankers did not want to admit exactly how much money was stolen because they were embarrassed that they had left the bank unguarded. So uh, Ned and Sophie could have retired from crime right then and there because the take was so big from this bank robbery, but they did not. And the truth was that Ned enjoyed robbing banks and it appears that Sophie was somewhat addicted to pickpocketing and shoplifting. And they were both eventually caught and convicted of those crimes. And they ended up together in Sing Sing prison, 30 miles north of New York City in 1871. So in this slide, you see the men's prison on the left and the women's prison on the right. So in early December of 1872, Ned was able to escape from Sing Sing through an elaborate plot that he had hatched with the help of colleagues outside the prison. And a couple of weeks later, he returned and helped uh, Sophie escape from the women's prison. They went to New York City, picked up their children, and they fled to Canada. Now, unfortunately for Ned, he'd gotten into a bar fight in New York a few years earlier. Remember, I told you he liked to fight. So during this fight, his opponent, who was another criminal, had bitten off the upper part of his ear. And this lack of an ear made him very recognizable to the police. And you can see it in this photo that he, the upper part of his ear is missing of his left ear. So he was arrested again and sent to prison. So that left Sophie alone by herself. So, so Sophie had to come up with some new ways to raise cash on her own. Now remember, her mother dressed her up in nice clothes when they went out to steal in New York City. So she really understood how tricking people into thinking she was somebody else could be useful to her. She also enjoyed acting and she came up with a new con that made good use of those skills. So posing as a wealthy woman, she would travel to a big city where no one knew her. Uh, in this case, you're looking at a, a hotel in Boston where she pulled this con and she would check in at the best hotel in town. This is the Revere House Hotel. And then she'd go to the office of a well-off respectable businessman and request his help with a real estate transaction. Then she claimed she'd forgotten the deed in her room and she'd ask him to meet her back at her room so they could talk over the deed there. And once he was in the door, Sophie would take off her clothes and suggest the man remove his clothes and get into bed with her. Now remember, this is at a time when a respectable woman didn't even show her ankles to a man who wasn't her husband, much less anything else. So Sophie then either threw the man's clothing out the window or locked it in a trunk. In the case of the Boston situation, she locked it in a trunk, and then she would force her victim to write out a check to her to get his clothing back. So naked and embarrassed, the men usually complied with her demands, but she was occasionally caught. And this is what happened in Boston in 1878. She had lured this elderly lawyer to her room at the Revere House Hotel. She'd locked his clothing in a trunk, forced him to write her a large check, but his bank was being especially cautious then because his checks had recently been stolen. She didn't know this. So when she showed up with the check, he was still locked in the room, of course. She showed up with the check. They didn't know who she was. She couldn't give them a good explanation of who she was and they called the police and she was arrested. And the police found a key to the Revere House Hotel on her. And it was the key to room 11. And so they went there and they found the man in the room, locked in the room without his clothes. And this, this uh, incident became known in the press as the room 11 affair. But usually the victims didn't wanna testify in court because of the cost to their reputation. So usually even if she did get caught and got pulled into court, she got off. And it was a very clever scam and it netted her a large amount of money for several years. And she really needed this money 
because she had a growing family to support. Now, Sophie had seven children, at least seven children over the course of her lifetime. And here you see the children that made it to adulthood, Florence, Victor, Lottie, and Sophia. Now, Sophie didn't, didn't intend to give up her career to keep the home fires burning. And indeed she wouldn't have been able to even if she wanted to. Um, so this is a time when there's of course no social safety net. And so Sophie was the source of the family income. So she had never had an education herself, but she appreciated the value of education and wanted her children to be educated. So she placed her children in boarding schools in Canada and in Europe, and she continued to work as a criminal all during their childhoods. But this lifestyle that she led took a very hard toll on the kids and two of her daughters died in early childhood. Her oldest son, George, ended up turning to crime in his teens and uh, eventually was placed in Auburn prison in New York where he died at the age of 20 of a contagious illness. And her children were also forced to take aliases to avoid, avoid being associated with her and their fathers. So they were placed in poor houses and orphanages when Sophie was incarcerated and wasn't able to pay the school bill. So it was really a difficult life for them. So Sophie made it hard for people to recognize her. This was one of her, her key attributes. She liked to, to wear these veiled hats. Um, and when she was pulling her crimes, she would often wear disguises. Now, when she would wear a veiled hat in court, which she did frequently, judges generally allowed her to do this, which is just sort of amazing to think about now. Um, but back then, you know, decent women were expected to cover themselves up in public. So Sophie's kind of using this to her advantage. And uh, you can see also in the engraving uh, uh, on the right that she's got her hair quite short. And this was something that she did uh, to make it easier for her to wear a wig. Uh, but Sophie was also very shrewd. She was very smart. She was able to think quickly on her feet. And when she was arrested, she would come up with all sorts of stories, casting herself as the victim to avoid ever showing, having to show up in court. It also helped her that she was able to cry on demand. She also had a very long list of aliases and here you see a few of those aliases. So in the late 1870s, it's become well known in New York and she established a home base for herself in Detroit, Michigan. Now this was a flourishing city. It was a growing city at this time. And it was ideally located for criminals because of the easy access from Detroit to Canada. Just a quick ferry ride across the Detroit River, River and you're in Windsor, Canada. So in Canada, Americans were outside the jurisdiction of American law enforcement. And many of these professional criminals from New York knew this and this drew them to Detroit. Uh, so Sophie put her children in private Catholic boarding schools in Windsor. And during her first few years in Detroit, uh, she was arrested for shoplifting. She tried to commit suicide in jail. She was beginning to show the symptoms of mental illness. The, and this is going to be an ongoing situation for her and it's gonna plague her for the rest of her life. But nonetheless, she continued to be to commit crimes and from her home base at Fort and 23rd Street, she began making pickpocketing expeditions to cities all over the Midwest, often with criminal friends from New York. And she would mail items that she'd stolen back to her housekeeper in Detroit. So in 1881, Sophie shot at a wealthy Detroit businessman she'd unsuccessfully tried to blackmail. Luckily for her, he did not want to testify in court like most of her blackmail victims. But by, the time the, by this time, the police knew who she was. They'd figured out that she was this well-known criminal from New York City, and they were desperate to get her out of Detroit. They really wanted to either lock her up or get her to leave town. So in 1882, she was arrested of pickpocketing a single watch and chain in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and she was sentenced to the house, Detroit House of Correction. Now, of course, she got a very good attorney 
and he appealed her conviction. He got her another trial. She was convicted again, and they appealed again, and she was finally found not guilty in 1884. But meanwhile, she's going back and forth with being in the Detroit House of Correction. But nonetheless, three trials for pickpocketing one watch was a record in Michigan at the time. Maybe still is, I don't know. So while she was in and out of prison, her family life really suffered. One of her daughters, a very young daughter, died at a convent in Windsor. Another daughter was adopted without her permission, and her young son was placed in the local poorhouse. And the older son, George, who'd been sent to prison in New York, died during this time. So <clears throat> Ned was also in prison again, Sophie's husband, and she hadn't seen him for years. So she filed for divorce. And then she took up with a new man. After she finally got out of the Detroit House of Correction, she joined forces with a younger man named Billy Burke, who was nicknamed Billy the Kid. Now we're not talking about William Bonney, the gunslinger who was arrested by Sheriff Pat Garrett in New Mexico. However, they were close to the same age. But Sophie's Billy was a short man with a very pleasant personality and a love of stylish clothing, which I think you can see from some of the pictures here. He was the son of Irish immigrants born in Massachusetts and raised in Chicago. Now, Billy and Sophie went around the country pulling sneak thief robberies. What is a sneak thief robbery? Sneak thieves were part bank robber and part con artists. They stole money by tricking or distracting people. Usually Sophie's role was to chat up a bank employee while Billy surreptitiously nabbed any cash that was sitting around unsecured. And sometimes he would use a retractable pincer on his umbrella or walking stick to do this to extend his reach. They were also penny waiters who uh, were thieves who stole from jewelry stores by substituting a paste gem for a real one. Again, this kind of crime required nerve, acting skills, sleight of hand, subterfuge, and uh, willingness to uh, basically be con people, which they were great at. So while Billy, who was often in prison, went to prison for bank a bank robbery that went bad in Kentucky, Sophie went to Europe in 1888, and she paired up there with another bank robber and a con man named Big Jim Brady. Now, Jim's criminal history stretched back to his teenage years in upstate New York. No police photo has survived of Big Jim, but here we see an illustration of him attempting to get away from the New York City police by jumping through a shop window. Looks pretty dangerous. Uh, <clears throat> after Sophie had a near miss with the police in Paris when the, she was pickpocketing there, she and Jim returned to Detroit and worked the crowds as pickpockets at the Detroit International Exposition and Fair in 1889. And then in 1890, they went to London and Jim became Sophie's third husband, despite the fact that she still wasn't divorced from Ned Lyons. And then at the age of 43, she had her last child, a daughter she named Sophia. Then Jim vanished under mysterious circumstances and Sophie returned to Detroit. Now in the 1890s, Sophie expanded her criminal enterprises. She opened a mail order, a, a marriage bureau, a mail order marriage bureau in which she collected fees for non-existent mail order brides. And the Chinese Exclusion Act, which was signed, in, signed into law in 1882, offered her another opportunity to make some illicit money. Uh, she began to smuggle uh, people, Chinese uh, men, in to Detroit from Windsor, Canada. And she, she did that rather briefly because she was, again, too well known for, to be involved in that sort of an activity that was to some extent public. But as the 19th century came to a close, she began to buy up real estate and earn an income, an honest income as a landlord. And she began to claim that she'd given up crime. So Billy and Sophie and Billy Burke, Billy the Kid, finally got married in 1910. And despite claiming to be a Detroit real estate agent, Billy was continuing his career as a thief, as a sneak thief, 
He was arrested and imprisoned in Stockholm, Sweden for attempted bank robbery in 1911. So Sophie traveled to Sweden to try to visit him in prison, but the jailers refused to let her see him and the Stockholm police arrested her as a suspicious person, but they let her go with only a warning. So this would be Sophie's final arrest. And one year after her adventures in Sweden, Sophie published her memoir, Why Crime Does Not Pay. The book is chock full of, of her adventures and the adventures of her friends and their heydays. And it's entertaining. And it contains some truth along with a lot of stories she made up or copied from newspapers. But she loved the attention that she got as, a, as, a, as an author. Did Sophie reform? She claimed in her memoir that she had been reformed for years, but of course we know she was arrested in 1912. Uh, the truth was that she really didn't give up crime until around the time her book came out. She, but she did know firsthand the damage that incarceration inflicts, inflicted on people's lives because it had really pretty much destroyed hers for many years. So around this time, she began doing charitable work uh, with a Detroit organization called the Pathfinders of America. And her friend and fellow Detroiter, James Wright, had organized this group. And their goal was to help prisoners learn better life habits and assist them in going straight after they were released from prison. And Sophie did really passionately support prison reform. And she advocated for prisoners getting more help when they were released. However, Sophie had suffered for many years for some type of from some type of mental illness. And it's likely that she had bipolar disorder or possibly even PTSD from her vi violent childhood or maybe both. And these illnesses were not understood then. So friends and family were often confused about her behavior and, and didn't understand what was going on. At times she would act bizarrely in public, arguing violently with friends and neighbors. And she even tried to burn down the house of one of her neighbors at one point. She also spent years feuding with her daughter Florence, who was the only one of her children who stayed living in Detroit, stayed living near her mother. So in May of 1924, Sophie collapsed in her home and she later died of a stroke at the hospital. She was cremated and buried in uh, Woodmere Cemetery in Detroit, not far from the home that she'd lived in for almost 50 years. The question on everybody's mind after Sophie died was how much was she worth? Because she had bragged for years that she was worth at least a million dollars. Now it turned out to be less than that, but it was still quite a lot. Her estate ended up being worth over $240,000 which is more than three and a half million dollars today. And despite ending up a rich woman, Sophie didn't leave very much to her family. So three of her children were still alive, but she left instructions that most of the money would go to build a charity home in Detroit for the children of criminals called, no big surprise, the Sophie Lyons Children's Home. So one of her daughters had developed schizophrenia during World War I and she was put in a mental asylum in England. And Sophie knew she was sick, but she only left her $2,000 in her will. And Sophie's oldest daughter, Florence, who you see here on the right, fought her mother's will all the way to the Michigan Supreme Court, claiming that her mother was not in her right mind and was mentally ill when she wrote her will. So Florence actually won this battle and a larger portion of the estate, the estate was reopened and a larger portion was allocated to her sixth sister in England. And the Sophie Lyons Children's Home was never built. So Sophie Lyons was a woman on the wrong side of the law for most of her life, clearly. She wrestled with many, many demons, childhood abuse, mental illness, lack of education, to name just a few. Ultimately though, she survived and she even thrived and she had truly a very fascinating life. 
So now <clears throat> I'll turn the, the microphone over to my friend Denise Testa, and she will tell you about two very interesting and really unsung women who were on the right side of the law and their clients who were most definitely not. Well, thank you, Shane. Uh, by 1920, when women were given the right to vote, all states admitted women to the bar. However, not every state allowed women to serve on juries. And many women attorneys weren't considered real lawyers. They were forced to accept jobs as stenographers and librarians in law firms. Few women found work in litigation and even fewer practiced criminal law. Women in the courtroom were considered a novelty and often weren't really taken very seriously. So I'd like you to meet two Mavericks who bucked convention by practicing criminal law during the golden age of the gangster. Our first attorney is Jesse Levy. Jesse was born in Siany, Russia, which is now the most northeastern portion of Poland. And she was born on July 6, 1898. And she was the eldest of four daughters in an Orthodox Jewish family. In June of 1904, the family immigrated to America and they finally ended up in South Bend, Indiana. Jesse was forced to drop out of school at the age of 16 to help support her family. And one of the jobs that she took was in an attorney's office. She also did become a, a reporter for the South Bend, one of the so local South Bend newspapers as well. Several years later, she took a job in an appellate judge's office and began to take night classes at Valparaiso University. In 1918, she became the first woman admitted into the Indiana University of Law. At the same time, she returned to earn her high school diploma in Short Ridge in Indianapolis. And also while moonlighting, because Jesse was always a very uh, busy, busy person. In her spare time, she moonlighted as a law clerk. And this is a picture of Jesse uh, shortly after she graduated from law school. Um, Jesse was first and foremost a suffragist. She became an attorney to focus on women's issues, especially married women who often lacked the legal means to control their own destiny. After the passage of the 19th Amendment, she cautioned the reporter not to expect suffrage to automatically change things except for giving us the right to vote. Now, for Jessie, again, like I said, she started out, um, she was going to practice law to, to uh, uh, handle women's issues, but she found that paying customers were really a scarce commodity. Most of her business was coming from divorce cases. On June 1st, 1925, she embarked on her first major criminal case. She represented Earl the Kid Northern, who was a 22-year-old bank robber who belonged to a gang headed by handsome Harry Pierpont, the same age, and um, he was already a, considered a career criminal. Pierpont would later become the mentor of John Dillinger and has often been credited with being the brains behind the Dillinger gang. In a courtroom jam-packed with spectators, Jesse was able to achieve a better-than-expected outcome for Earl the Kid Northern using handsome Harry Pierpont as a key witness. Our second attorney that I'd like to talk about today is Bess Robbins. Bess was six years younger, but she had a similar background to Jesse. Bess graduated early from the Indiana University of Law School, and then she was forced to put her career on hold until she turned 21 years old. In addition to women's issues, Bess was also keenly interested in prison reform and revamping the parole system. And kind of a little interesting fact, though, John Dillinger would be one of a group of convicts whose parole she convinced the Indiana governor to expedite. So again, Bess was, um, Bess was another um, lady forward before her time. She was also one of the earliest women to serve in the Indiana House of Representatives. And she was the first woman elected to serve three consecutive terms in 1933, 1935, and 1937. In this article, Bess is quoted as saying she enjoys her criminal work perhaps more than any other face. And in the future, she hopes for a straight murder case, her nearest being so far a case of assault and battery with intent to kill. Well, she would soon get her wish. Now, we've talked about the two ladies that are involved in my book. I'd like to go back to, to John Dillinger for a little bit. Surprisingly, John Dillinger had a really short career as a bank robber. It went, started probably in May or June of 1933 and went uh, through uh, to July of 1934. He'd been friends when he was in the penitentiary with a clique of bank robbers. And seeing that he was going to get paroled earlier than the rest of them, the leader of the group, Harry Pierpont, trained Dillinger to be the outside man to facilitate their escape. Once outside, John Dillinger began robbing banks to raise money for what would become the largest prison break to date. The bank above is in Bluffton, Ohio, and this is where I was born. So it was also happens to be the beginning of the Dillinger saga. Several days before this, this prison break was supposed to take place, 
John Dillinger was caught in Dayton, Ohio, while visiting a girlfriend. So what happened was he robbed banks all through Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky, and probably Michigan as well. Um, and the bank that he robbed did Bluffton, that wasn't all that much a large dollar amount. But instead of being sent back to Indiana where he committed robberies for these much higher dollar amounts, Dillinger's attorney got him transferred to the Allen County Jail in Lima, Ohio. In the meantime, on September 26, 1934, 10 convicts broke out of the Indiana State Penitentiary in Michigan City. Grateful for John Dillinger's assistance when they heard of these predicament, plans were hatched to return the favor. So what happened was on October 12, 1933, five escaped prisoners, it was Harry Pierpont, Charles Makeley, Russell Clark, Harry Copeland, and Ed Schaus, and John Hamilton, um, all rolled into Lima to break John Dillinger out of jail. Furious because the $10,000 bribe the gang had paid had not resulted in John Dillinger's release, Harry Pierpont shot and then pistol whipped Sheriff Jeff Sarber during the jailbreak. The sheriff died on the operating table as a result of these injuries a little over an hour later. John Dillinger and those six who had helped him escape, along with Harry Pierpont's girlfriend, Mary Northern Kinder, who happened to be Earl the Kid Northern's sister, formed the nucleus of the first John Dillinger gang, and they became a began a rampage of crime throughout the Midwest. Their first stop happened to be a police station in Auburn, Indiana, where they locked up the officers and made off with weapons and ammunition. This was gonna be the first of three different police stations that the Dillinger gang hit over the next few months. They moved on then to robbing banks in Greencastle, Indiana, Racine, Wisconsin, and East Chicago, Indiana. In the process, two more officers of law died during several high-profile shootouts. And law enforcement throughout the country considered the John Dillinger gang extremely dangerous. So by now, every move that the, the gang had made was really considered newsworthy. So when Tucson, Arizona police captured five members without a shot being fired, the event made front page headlines around the world. And this was when Jesse Levy and Bess Robbins became involved with the uh, John Dillinger gang. Jesse would represent Harry Pierpont, Charles Makeley, Russell Clark, and Mary Kinder, while Bess's clients were Harry Copeland and Hilton Crouch. So eventually it was agreed that Harry Pierpont, Charles Makeley, and Russell Clark would be returned to Lima, Ohio to face charges of murdering the sheriff, Sheriff Jeff Sarber, while John Dillinger ended up being sent to Crown Point, Indiana. The armed gentleman here in the picture that you see Standing behind Harry Pierpont is Don Sarber, who was appointed the interim sheriff after his father died. At 24 years old, he was the youngest sheriff in the country at the time. And to add even more pressure to Don's, Don's uh, job, his mother had been one of the eyewitnesses to his father's assault and subsequent death. The second of Jesse Levy's clients was Charles Makeley. And although Jess, Sheriff Jeff Sarber told his son and others before he died that his assailants were all big men, Charles Makeley was one of the shortest uh, members of the gang, standing at five foot seven. He was tried for murder after Bess Robbins blocked the extradition of her client from Indiana back to, to Ohio to stand trial for murder. So basically what they did was substitute in Charles Makeley for Harry Copeland for the, the murder charges. The third client that Jesse Levy represented was Russell Clark. And uh, he, was, he stood about six foot one inch. Each of these three murder trials ran back to back. So what that meant was when a trial would end, um, so a trial would probably end like on a Friday or Saturday, that next Monday, that following Monday, the uh, trial would start back up again. And in Russell Clark's case, it left Jesse Lee with less than 24 hours to prepare. Another problem with all these trials being run so closely together was uh, the trial transcripts were actually delayed by a day or two, and it made it really difficult for the attorneys to go back through and, and look for discrepancies in the uh, witnesses' testimony. And there were some, definitely were some, some discrepancies. To add even more problems to everything, uh, two days before the first murder trial was supposed to start, which was for Perry Pierpont, John Dillinger escaped. Uh, supposedly he uh, bluffed his way out by carving a wooden gun uh, carved from a, a washboard in his, in his jail cell. And uh, it made headlines, again, like I said, throughout the world. After receiving multiple threats, Harry Pierpont's attorney quit the night before the, the trial was supposed to start. And the prosecution was just confident. They were thrilled. They thought that they had chased off any competent attorney that would, would dare represent uh, Harry Pierpont. And uh, they were shocked that morning when Jesse Levy arrived to defend Harry Pierpont. Once John Dillinger escaped, 
what happened uh, was National Guard were called in. Machine gun nests were built around the town. All train stations and roads leading into Lima had checkpoints for anybody going into the city. And anybody who entered that courthouse, with the exception of the judge and the prosecution, were subjected, subjected to a standard detective bureau search. So what that meant, if you were going in, you weren't even involved with the trial, anything like that, but you had business in that in that courthouse, you were going to get uh, you were going to get patted down by the the National Guard. While interviewing prospective jurors, uh, when it became Jesse's turn to to question them, the National Guard would begin target practice outside the courthouse. So again, you know, there's a lot of undue influence, you know, happening. During the second day of Harry Pierpont's trial, John Dillinger and his new gang, including Babyface Nelson, robbed the Security National Bank and Trust Company of Sioux Falls in South Dakota. So as you can see there with uh, Harry Pierpont's face, things are not looking too too good for the for his trial. So it made headlines, like I said, throughout. This was a, a really huge, huge deal throughout the country at the time. So four jailbreaks, three murder trials, two stays of execution, and a case that was dismissed uh, later became these headlines. And that top one is courtesy of the special agent in charge of the FBI's Indianapolis office. When you look at this, I mean, they really run the gamut of, of how they considered uh, the Jesse and Bess and uh, how, you know, what they, how they represented the, uh, uh, the uh, Dillinger gang. Um, and so you can kind of question yourself, what, what, <laughs> how are they, how are these women considered? Well, I wanted to just back up a little bit. Jesse had, Jesse and Beth both left a, a great legacy. Jesse was one of the six, first of the six Indiana women to attend the first National Association of Women's Lawyers Conference. And this is a group picture that you see here. Um, she and Bess joined to fight against protective legislation based on discriminatory practices and law restricting women's access to the courtroom and to the office. So what this means, that's kind of a mouthful, but the 19th Amendment did not guarantee any woman the right to vote. Instead, what it meant was the laws reserving the ballot for men became unconstitutional. Women still had to negate a, a maze of uh, state laws meant to keep them from exercising their rights. And this is actually where Jesse, Levy, and Bess Robbins made their most lasting contributions. Um, their unwillingness to back down from causes they believed in that they demonstrated so well with the Dillinger gang served them well in, in this particular respect. History may have forgotten about Jesse, Levy, and Bess Robbins, but the less legacy they left behind actually does still remain till today. And just some kind of final thoughts about our, our, our two protagonists here. Um, Sophie Lyons spent most of her life as a criminal at a time when there were few female, few female professional criminals. That lifestyle had many challenges, yet it seemed in the long run to serve her well. She ended up wealthy and is still one of the best known criminals of the era. On the other hand, Jesse and Bess were law-abiding women who pursued atypical careers as attorneys. They were afraid to represent the outcasts of society, including criminals, but times and changing social norms eventually forced them to put this part of their career behind them. So what happened was when books on the John Dillinger gang began to enter the marketplace, attorneys Jesse Levy and Bess Robbins vanished from the records. It, it became like a boys only club with just a handful of passing references told from the perspective of what made a good story. And in this case, a lot of times uh, they'd often get dismissed as being either incompetent or on a tape. So hopefully our attitudes are changing. I'd like to share a quote from Jeanette Bates, one of the first women to join an attorney general's office. I think it sums up things pretty nicely for our first a few women here on the opposite sides of the law. Some women will make good in the courts, some in the kitchen. A woman's place is wherever she makes good. Thank you. And we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Welcome. Great. Thank you You're so welcome. much.
I don't see any questions, so. I don't see any either. Okay. But we did record it. I'll stop it in a second and we'll post it. If not today, then Monday. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you thank you. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Oh, well, thanks very, a lot. You're very knowledgeable. Must have been fun researching it. It yep. was. <laughs> very <laughs> fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks you're welcome. a lot.